Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Katie Valentine. I'm the director of DSF Discover. I'm really excited that everyone is here. Uh, I want to do a quick sound check and tech check. Can everyone hear me? Can you see me? I'm going to type into the chat box real quick. And see and hear me. Re I'm just telling you, refresh your browser if you can't. But of course, if you can't see or hear me, you won't know that. Uh, I said that. <laughs> All right. Um, yeah, so we would love to do a little sound check. Uh, let me know if you can if you can see and hear. We would love to know where everyone is from. Hey, all right. So I see people can see and hear us, which is fantastic. Yeah, we would love to know where everyone is tuning in from today. And thank you for being here on a Friday afternoon slash evening, depending on where you are. Or if you're on the other side of the world, maybe it's Saturday morning. So <laughs> very special that you're here. And I am so pleased to welcome um, Reverend Paul Che. And he is here to share lots with us about being a just church, being a peacemaking church. I know how challenging um, it can be when you're in the middle of church life and you're worried about di dividing your church. You're running low on energy for um, those of us in the liturgical church. We've just started Lent and, you know, it's a great time for talking about peacemaking. But I know how busy it is when you're uh, when you're in the middle of church life, whether you're a pastor, or whether you're a parishioner. I'm so really glad you're here to get some practical tips on creating a just and peacemaking church. Really, really exciting. And it's been fantastic to work with Paul on developing this. Um, so be sure to stick around to the very end. We've got some announcements about DSF Discover. I want to make sure everyone gets those announcements. And then we want to hear from you about what you want in the future around this topic. So we're, we're going to have some conversation about that. Um, so I will I will hand it over now, Paul. I'm so I'm so glad you're here. Any questions for before we get started? Uh, no, I think I'm good. Thank All you. right. OK, I'll load up your PowerPoint. Now okay. I'm here for tech for anyone who needs any tech help throughout. Feel free to use the chat. I'll be monitoring the chat for everyone. If you have any other technical questions, you can just reach out to me. I'm going to go ahead and turn off my webcam. And yeah, Paul, just take it away. So glad that you're here. OK, so uh, I also need to turn off my webcam, I guess. And then, <clears throat> thank you, Katie. Uh, and then I really appreciate this opportunity. And then um, thank you so much for inviting me to uh, really uh, meet with the people in this, um, I mean, through the webinar today. Uh, and then today I'm just uh, like to share a little bit about uh, how we can create a just peacemaking church. Um, and this uh, would be, I hope that uh, uh, this gives you a really idea to think about your own community, uh, how to be, how to be a just peacemaking community. Uh, it doesn't have to be only a church. I think it can be an even small group uh, of your church, or it can be uh, your own family members who think about how the, as a family, you know, can seek the peace, uh, and is peace, which is also just, uh, 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 which is also entails justice. So, um, let's think about this, some questions first. So, you know, uh, whether you also share these uh, questions also. Uh, Katie, would you uh, move the slide? So uh, just one more slide. So let's see whether you share these um, concerns uh, like, uh, like me. So violence is all around you, but your church doesn't respond in ways that you think are uh, impactful. Or is there any hesitation to create a true peacemaking uh, church or community because uh, they are fearful of splitting membership or not quite sure where to, where to start to be effective in creating a just peace and make a just peacekeeping church? So if you have a, a if you share this concern together, uh, then hopefully today I can answer uh, this. Uh, three questions, uh, three concerns here today throughout the webinar. And then let's think about, uh, first, let's think about the, the, you know, how we can, uh, where we can start actually. 
uh, I was at one, one time a local church pastor, and then I really wanted to make sure that uh, my church members uh, really be a, a true vehicle for the peacemaker, I mean, the, to bring a peace to the community. And also, but it's not just a peace, but peace that entails justice. Uh, so, but when we talk about this, the words like peace, justice, or um, the uh, or uh, peacemaking, I think that sometimes these are so really the big words for our uh, our folks in the few, or even you know the people in my own small group within the church. So I was really um, uh, concerned, and you know how I can help the church or. Uh, my Bible study group can uh, think about this, uh, these issues uh, in a way that, you know, they feel like, yes, I can make a, some difference. I can make a difference in my community, uh, in this world. You know, uh, it is not just something that others can do, others who, who lead this country can do, but even my church members, you know, even I can do, you know, even I can, even, you know, something that I can make a difference for for this world. So, uh, Katie, uh, if you just uh, move the slide to next one. So I like to suggest some practical uh, process. So by any means, this is not a step, but this is uh, rather the process that you can use to encourage your own community members to think about how we can be uh, just peacemaking community together. So the, here is uh, the four questions that we can ask together as a, as a group of people. First, so does your community understand the context in which we are called? Uh, and then does, then does your community know what to do? And the following question would be, does your community know why we are doing what we want to do? And lastly, does your community know how we are doing it? So if we can move to the next uh, slide, I now just realized that I can use, uh, uh, I also, I can move my own slide. <laughs> either, <laughs> either way works just fine. Yeah, and um, as we're doing that, I'd just be curious if those four questions resonate with people like, um, I'm kind of shifting through those four questions within your community. Mm -hmm. So just feel free to use the chat. We'll, we'll keep up to date. So the first thing that I, I'd like to start uh, is that uh, we need to ask together, again, together, does your community understand the context in which we are called? And then uh, I'd like to give you some uh, the I'd like to just, uh, you know, uh, share some context in which we, uh, we are in the United States and North America and probably, in, you know, uh, also another context in, uh, from our own, um, struggle as a, uh, the Christian community. So we'll watch, uh, uh the, this first video together. Katie? Yes. And I have come here because I believe that revolutionary love is the call of our times. And I have come here because I believe that revolutionary love is the call of our times. Because on the same day, at the same time my son was born, People were marching in city streets across this nation, protesting the killing of black unarmed bodies, hands up, chanting, I can't breathe.
because when Govey was only eight weeks old, I had to bundle my son up and take him to a candlelight vigil to mourn the lives of three Muslim students, all shot in the head in Chapel Hill by a man who despised religion. And I imagine my son their age one day, and I, I couldn't breathe. Because last month in Chicago, the site of the first world parliament, Another sick father was beaten to the ground, beaten bloody, called terrorist. 100 years after my family has called this country home, 14 years after 9-11, our bodies are seen as perpetually foreign and potentially terrorist. Just as black bodies are seen as criminal, brown bodies illegal, trans bodies immoral, indigenous bodies savage, women's bodies as property, no more, no more. No more, because when we call bodies inferior and strange to ours, it becomes easier to imprison them, to rape them, to kill them. No more. I say no more. No more. No more. No more. So, um, so, uh, she actually um, uh, really addresses many issues that we are dealing uh, on your mic. On. There you go. If we can understand our own um, the co the context, uh, probably it is hard to see, uh, you know, what we are really, uh, why we really need to do what. So uh, maybe it is very important for us to introduce our own cultural context with a question that how can we seek. Uh, seek peace in our community and our nation as a body of Christ. So uh, let's just watch uh, the uh, another another video. Great, and everyone can hear the first one, correct? My name is Diane Borshaylin. On May twenty fourth. 30 women leaders from around the world plan to cross the DMZ from North to South Korea, calling for an end to the Korean War and peace and reconciliation on the Korean Peninsula. My filmmaking partner, Ramsey Lim and I are planning to make a new film called Crossings about this historic event. We've been given full access to film in both North and South Korea. The Korean War was catastrophic. Approximately four million people were killed, mostly civilians. In 1953, an armistice was signed that stopped the fighting, but a permanent peace treaty was never signed, leaving Korea divided and the Korean Peninsula a potential flashpoint for renewed fighting. It was spoken of by our government as temporary and now it's 70 years later. This is the 70th anniversary of the division of Korea. The walk isn't the end goal of the project so much as a beginning for a long-term um, movement and campaign internationally to build peace um, and reconciliation. We're hoping to walk with North Korean women to the DMZ, where we will be met by our Korean sisters in the South. And together, women from around the world will call for an end to the Korean War and for a new beginning for Korea. We will be filming this group for 11 days as they meet with women leaders in both North and South Korea and explore the prospects for building genuine international solidarity. Ending the Korean War and finding a meaningful path toward reunification will not be achieved overnight, but a revitalized journey toward peaceful reconciliation on the Korean Peninsula can begin with a single step, a step across a one-foot concrete border at the DMZ.
So we're launching this Kickstarter campaign to seek your support and also to ask you to join us on this historic journey. So as a person who grew up in Korea, uh, this is a really personal, but at the same time, I really hope that um, our, uh, the, the issue of the Korean Peninsula is not only the matter of the people who live in the Korea. This is a geographically, uh, geopolitically actually very closely connected to each other. So, uh, what is happening during the Korean War or before Korean War is uh, closely tied to what was uh, uh, the decisions that, that were made here in the United States. So, still, uh, the war between the Korean, North Korea and South Korea couldn't be resolved by only by the people uh, who live in the North and South Korea. Uh, now the uh, armistice was actually uh, was uh, uh, was made by North Koreans and U.S. Uh, and then also the China. South Korea never actually uh, signed that armistice uh, at all. So if we uh, if they like to uh, finish the war, it's, it's gonna be three party talk first. So the three parties who signed that armistice, um, and the United States is one of, one of the three parties. So many things are happening in this world, actually, geopolitically, it's not just, uh, it's not a matter of, you know, the people who live in those afflicted area, but it is closely, closely tied to uh, diplomatically, economically, politically to the United States. So as a leaders of the uh, faith community, I think it is very important for us to help the people to see how the, how many things is connected uh, and weaved together. And then we can ask uh, together, how can we seek peace among nations and peoples? Um, and then here's another video, short video. Let's watch it. Great. And um, while I'm pulling that up, one of our, uh, Cynthia wanted to know who the woman was. And I believe in the first video, do you happen to know that, Paul? Oh, uh, she's the Valerie, uh, I forgot, just uh, her last name is uh, slipped through uh, my mind, I mean, the slip through my mind. Uh, her first name is Valerie. And then actually I was uh, sitting uh, uh, among people while she was uh, talking. Um, and then she's an activist uh, from the the Sikh community here in the United States. Um, I'll, I'll get to that later. Uh, I, I, now, yeah, my mind went to blank. I know, right, right on the spot. No, if you just yeah. get that to me, I'll email it to everyone. All right. Perfect. All right, here we go with the third video. Well, it's often said that religion is the number one cause of war, but the three volume Encyclopedia of Wars, which chronicles almost 1,800 conflicts waged over the course of human history, categorizes just 123 as being religious. It's an easy generalization to make. Fighting in Central African Republic is regarded as being between Muslims and Christians. Buddhists and Rohingya Muslims are at the heart of violence in Myanmar. And conflict in Northern Ireland had its roots in religion. The Palestinian-Israeli conflict is also seen as having a religious dimension. But in all these examples, there may be more fundamental driving forces, be it land, power, or nationalism. So, our religion, uh, not just the Christianity, but um, the most uh, the the most religions in this world, I, uh, it's a, has have been a part of uh, the conflicts, unfortunately. So. Um, especially as a Christians, we claim the message of reconciliation and peace, but yet uh, we remain also divided, um, and our division betrays the very message that we proclaim sometimes. Um, so we can ask to one another, how can Christians come together to be a sign of healing and reconciliation? 
And how should Christians work with the work with and engage other religions for peace in our world? I think it, uh, many our uh, many people in our own faith communities um, haven't had a chance to ask these questions. How we as a Christians can work with uh, other relig religious uh, people to bring peace that entails justice to our, to our world. So we need to help them to think about these questions. And then the, finally, here's a one story that I'd like to share. Uh, this, this was a letter, uh, letter that my predecessor, the Reverend Dr. Robert Welsh received. And then um, uh, this might also help you to think about our own, uh, the divisions among the Christians. Katie? Yes. This one will take me just a second to get it set up. Mm -hmm. And this is the audio, correct? Mm -hmm. All right. But there's no sound. Hold on. Mm -hmm. Let me do that again. <laughs> I see the problem. Here we go. Hi, Robert. I just read your article about speaking up for full sharing in the Eucharist at the recent Catholic Synod of Bishops, and I was moved to tears. I, too, am married to a Catholic. My daughter has converted and married a Catholic, and my granddaughter is now being raised Catholic. I am the one left out of the Eucharist every Sunday. The only way I was able to participate in communion was to go to another church. But it was important for me to worship as a family, so I made the sacrifice to join them in worship at Mass. But it definitely hurts to sit still in the pew as they all go up to receive something I was taught that as a child of God, I should receive as well. Recently, I have had some health problems, and my family has been worried. Now, when we attend Mass together, my husband accepts the wafer in his hand, and when he gets back to the pew, he rips it in half and gives it to me. He tells me this will help me heal. What a sad situation this is. My prayer is not only for my body to heal, but for the church to heal as well. Your words are healing to me. Well, when I the, heard, this, uh, heard this story first, it was very powerful. And then realized, uh, and it also made me realize that, so uh, seeking justice and peace, it's not just out there in the world. Actually, we need to uh, seeking peace uh, within the church, the the capital C church. So we need to really seriously ask how can we as Christians work more intentionally for healing of the church. So our work is inside out. It's not just the uh, we Christians or uh, the people in the in the religious traditions can work for the uh, the people who are afflicted by the conflicts, but it is also work for our uh, own selves. So I just uh, shared some context that I've been thinking about, uh, especially related to uh, our work uh, for just peacemaking. And here is a something, uh, here is a one small practice that you can do with uh, your uh, small group members or uh, your, your church members together. And then I uh, titled this practice, uh, this little exercise, Newspaper Profits. Um, so I think uh, you can ask uh, your small group members, your church members, uh, or the group of people that you, you work with can bring any newspapers, uh, uh, to the, to a meeting and then brainstorm together, uh, a list of headlines gotta ask us to speak to or speak for or speak against. Um, or even you can do some, uh, you know, the, uh, some, uh, activity by asking, you know, what is the most hope-filled news you have found in the newspapers? Or what is the most horrifying news that uh, that really um, made you down? Uh, so, you, you know, 
you can ask people to bring uh, newspapers, I mean, national newspapers to uh, really lo small local newspapers and then just uh, do um, this uh, small exercise and then, and then see what kind of, uh, you know, the news that we are, uh, we are here, we are read every day. Um, and then the, uh, then I really hope that this exercise can really help us to, you know, to see what is really going on in our own local communities, um, also. Uh, and then, uh, in light of what is going on in our local communities, uh, also we can ask ourselves, what kind of neighbors are we to those, uh, the people who live in our local community? Um, uh, and then, um, again, uh, by, you know, the reading the newspapers together and we're sharing the, some news from, uh, our own communities, we can think about what is happening in, happening, uh, at a city council meetings or, uh, city hall or state house meetings. Um, think it, this is, this is a very in, uh, important, the process that, you know, uh, that can help us to really think about what, I mean, what specific context that we, in which we are, uh, live, um, right now. And then how that has been, uh, affected us, um, especially in emotionally, psychologically, and, uh, and then also physically, uh, and economically and politically. So, uh, we can really encourage people to think about our own context first by doing um, uh, this small exercise together. So after we look into our uh, cultural, social, and national, or local, uh, international, or you know, um, or global context, um, probably the next the following question that we have to ask together. Would be so. The, you know, does my community know what to do then? I mean, now we've been collecting these uh, stories that are related to the context that or uh, social context or cultural context that we live in. Uh, we live in, but we're not gonna just uh, let these things happening again and again. Uh, I mean, if there is a certain the event or incident that will help us to see a hope, then we will share these uh, stories with others. And if there are some, uh, the unjust, unjust, uh, unjust things going on in our own community, then uh, we cannot just uh, let these things happen over and over again, but yet we have to ask, so what, what we can do? Um, and then, then then as the leaders of this community, we can uh, provide some theological uh, grounding for our own people. And then also, uh, and then also we can uh, really remind ourselves as, you know, so where, where are those areas that we can, um, we can really consider to uh, tackle together. So, uh, definitely our call is a seeking just peace in the world. And then, but, um, but as I shared, uh, earlier today, uh, these are, these words are really big words, you know, just peace or peacemaking. So, uh, it is important for us to provide some care, uh, the categories, categories, uh, because, you know, our brain has in certain ways to process the things. So maybe, you know, providing these, uh, some categories so that people can think about, uh, where we can really work, uh, together. So, uh, this is not a, uh, the categories that I created. This is actually the, uh, from the ecumenical document. But, uh, we can think about our own community. 
uh, seeking peace in the community. And of course, we can think about the seeking peace with the earth uh, in light of what is going on. I mean, the, uh, with the, with the earth, you know, the climate changing, climate changing. Uh, and then the people are so affected by the climate change right now. Uh, especially the people in the, uh, Pacific Islands, uh, they are more concerned about, you know, uh, how long they can have uh, the dry land. Also, of course, we can think about the marketplace. Uh, there's some economic, uh, injustice everywhere. Um, and if we go to we expand our horizon to the global level, uh, yes, we can think about what is happening here in international communities. So this is a four categories we can provide people to process. And, uh, so seeking peace in the community, with the earth, in the marketplace, and among peoples. And, um, but, but, you know, as a small group of people, we cannot do everything. Oh, we wish we could do, uh, we, we can tackle anything happening in this world. But again, with the limited resources and then, um, that, you know, human resources and also financial resources, um, uh, and then as a small group of people, sometimes it is hard to do anything we feel like. So, uh, here's another practice that I like to suggest. Uh, I call it the envelope practice. And then, um, you know, just, ask, you know, ask people to imagine that, you know, uh, our church or our faith community has received a letter from God and asking, you know, our community to address about or to tend one of the unjust areas in our community. And then we, uh, we can think together, you know, what would it be? Uh, why are we feeling uh, it is the area to which God calls uh, our church to care for? So uh, we, we can start as an individual practice. I mean, we can just uh, um, distribute some the uh, letter uh, uh, letter has, uh, and then saying this is from God, and then you know, we can encourage the individuals to think about so which area it should be. And then later, uh, as a group, we can share, um, what people, you know, what others to, what others to think, uh, what others think, think it is most important, uh, uh, matter to, uh, to address. Um, and also, uh, we need to really think about, yeah, there's a good thing and versus, uh, and then also there is a God thing. What I mean is that, uh, yeah, there are plenty of matters that is happening, uh, which is, which are unjust. But, um, as I shared, one community cannot be good at doing everything. So it is important to discern God's calling. And this is where, uh, we see the importance of a community. Uh, and, uh, and when we do this work together, I mean, when we work we, when we like to work on this, I mean, so on a particular matter, uh, uh, it is very important for us to work collectively as a, uh, community of faith. But most times that, you know, we really focus on, uh, the what part, you know, we like to think about, um, yeah, what we can do and, and, uh, you know, we like to just get into, I mean, get our hands and uh, the hands dirty and, uh, we like to make a difference. But at the same time, I think it is very important for us to understand why we are doing what we are doing. Because we are not just, uh, the group of people who have a good will to make a difference in this world or community. We are, uh, the faith community and we base on our, uh, I mean, and we believe that this is a God's calling. Um, so it is also important for us to, uh, to, 
to provide some grounding for our own folks. So especially as a disciple of Christ, that's my personal, um, uh, I mean, this is disciple of Christ is my, uh, my own community. And then, uh, Katie reminded me that, uh, some of you are actually, uh, are not, uh, are not a disciples of Christ. So, uh, I will share my own context, you know, my own, the, uh, the faith community, but also you can think about your own, uh, the community that you belong to. So, um, you know, disciples and just peace making, it's a very close, uh, because we clearly say in our identity, uh, statement that we are disciples of Christ, a movement for wholeness in a fragmented world. As a part of the one body of Christ, we welcome all to the Lord's table as God has welcomed us. So, uh, this is our identity statement. It is not just, uh, so doing a just peacemaking work is, is a something come from my own goodwill. It is, but also this is a, uh, embedded in our own identity as a faith community. So I think, uh, uh, it is true to any faith community, uh, any Christian faith community. Uh, it's not just uh, um, the staple of the disciples of Christ. We, uh, but the disciples of Christ uh, just uh, uh, simply wanted to uh, clearly say to uh, the people uh, who belong to uh, this community that we, as a community, seeking to be a movement for wholeness. And then our history tells, uh, you know, that, um, this is, uh, here's the Barton Stone and Thomas Campbell, uh, our two founding fathers. And then they opposed, uh, uh opposed to war, uh, as a denier of the gospel, co gospel command to love God and to love your neighbor as yourself. Um, so especially, uh, our two founding fathers were seeking the oneness and unity. So injustice, they see it, they saw injustice as, uh, the betrayer of the gospel see, and a betrayer of our commitment to seeking unity and oneness with all Christians. So this is something, uh, that, I mean, the, the making just peace. Is, is actually started with our founding fathers. And, um, also we need to go back to, uh, our, you know, the, to the Bible simply. And then there's a biblical concept of shalom. So the shalom, what is the shalom? It is sometimes uh, in, uh, translated as a, uh, uh, the wholeness. So shalom, um, basically means peace, but it is not, uh, uh, it doesn't mean only that absence of war. The peace is a more act, um, it's an action that actively seeking out, uh, out, uh, uh, out peace among people. So, and also, uh, it is a state, uh, status, uh, state of, status of wholeness, and then if only the Christians or a certain group of religious people can have a peace while others suffer from uh, the conflicts or war, then it, the wholeness that we are seeking cannot be completed because without the uh, wholeness of uh, the entire humanity or with the creation, there, there can be uh, the wholeness for only for the, the, uh, one group of people. So as a Christians, it is important for us to, uh, understand the shalom is not for, not only for the people who f follow Christ, but this is for every human being, every creation on earth. Uh, 
Um, and then also here is our biblical call from the Ephesian chapter two, for he is, a, he is our peace and in his flesh, he has made both groups into one and has a broken down the dividing walls. That is the hostility between us. So yeah, Apostle Paul really believed that, uh, you know, the Christ, our peace, uh, broke down the dividing walls. So this is, uh, um, this is our calling from Christ. We are called to break down the dividing walls. And then uh, peace is uh, related to love. And peace is related to justice and freedom that God has granted to, uh, once again, to all human beings and in all creation. And then also we understand this as a ecumenical call. So this is not the call for the one group of people. Uh, actually, the whole global ecumenical uh, movement uh, is called to work together to bring just peace. Um, so we this is not a step of one group of people again. This is a global calling, uh, especially, and then this is a ecumenical calling. And again, uh, probably many of you understand where the ecum ecumenism, the, the word ecumenism come from. Uh, is uh, is from the, um, the word, uh, oikumene, uh, which means the, this is uh, the unity of the whole inhabited earth. So, once again, our calling is uh, is really uh, from as a just a one small tiny the Christian fraction, but this is actually calling as a, the one Christ body. So after we understand, you know, so where we are grounded theologically or biblically, uh, now we can ask uh, to our own people then, so uh, how can we, how can we really be a uh, just peacemaking uh, people? You know, do we really know how we can do it? So. Um, of course, answer is very simple. You know, we do ecumenically and interreligiously, uh, and then that's actually our principle. And then uh, I'm wondering if you are familiar with uh, uh, the Lund principle. So Lund principle is the ecumenical principle, but I think uh, this can be uh, this can be adapted to uh by us when we are seeking we are seeking uh to be a just peacemaking uh, church so Lund principle uh it was uh, came from the meeting of faith and order in 1952 which was held in Lund and then it is uh, simply uh it can uh it states that churches should act together in all matters except those in which uh, deep differences of a conviction compel them to act separately. Um, this was the uh, this was uh, the the principle still that we hold on to. Um, yeah, we we are also realistic. Yes, there is a certain issues that we cannot do together because there is uh, uh, the deep difference. Uh, of our convictions, but yet um, we really like to uh, work together, act together, and work together in all matters, in all matters. So, uh, and then in order to understand then, you know, uh, we work ecumenically, interreligiously, inter we can do a small practice together uh, and then I like to call this uh, 
practice this exercise the mapping process and um uh, and then ask our, the members of our community to actually find out uh, which faith communities or organizations or civil groups uh, that are working currently to bring just peace to the world. Um, so, and then created a, the wall chart. Uh, I said uh, uh, it's, um, uh, there's a typo, but uh, sort of we, you know, we created the wall chart and then write down those organizations uh, that you know each member uh, each members uh, to find under the the uh, the four key tasks four key, you know that I suggested that um, um, just earlier you know those uh, the here is a one organization that is a seeking peace in the community and then we name uh, we put the name and then we can just give a, a very brief uh, detail about their work um, and then. We can find uh, any organization within with within our com own community that is working to bring uh, justice and peace to the earth, and also of course there are many groups, civil groups even that are working for the for bringing justice to a marketplace. So we put those the names that are working for those uh, the um, the economic justice, and then give a little brief descriptions. And of course, uh, we can think about some uh, the, some organizations and communities that are working uh, on the international issues. So I think the mapping also gives us that, uh, okay, here are a group of people that we don't have to invent a new will at all. Uh, actually, first time, I mean, the first thing that we can do is uh, we can think about how, I mean, who, we can uh, partner with. So this kind of uh, the mapping pro uh, mapping process really help us to see. Okay, um, here is a you know so many different uh, the organizations and groups that are working on the particular issues, and then that will help us to see which one, uh, which which organization that we can work. Uh, with um so here is so in summary um i think uh, the creating a just peacemaking community um is sometimes it's a really daunting task but i hope that uh, by asking these uh four rather simple questions and then uh, with a uh, little practices with uh, my own um church members, community members, that will help us to um, think about, I mean, the think about uh, how, uh, where we can start. Um, so hopefully this has been helpful for you to just uh, have uh, some practical uh, guideline, uh, you know, practical suggestions when you started uh, thinking about uh, the encourage your own community members to, uh, to be a just peacemaking uh, community together. So, and then we'll see uh, where is God taking us. Um, so, my presentation is, uh, uh, is uh, uh, this is my, the end of my presentation. Uh, and then I like to see whether uh, uh, there's anyone uh, who has any questions or suggestions and comments. Yeah, while well, those are coming in, um, and Paul, you might want to turn on your camera too so people can see okay. us. I'll go ahead and turn the PowerPoint off. Uh, thank you so much. Those practical suggestions, I love them because they, they're they ways to make very concrete, very real, because I know that I feel overwhelmed too. And I mean, just one example, like the environment, I get, I care so much, but I do get really overwhelmed with it. Yeah, and if someone had said, you know, this is how we make an impact. <laughs> on a chart and like other people who are doing it, I wouldn't feel alone. I, it's such a great, uh, I love that exercise. All right, I got distracted with my own thoughts. <laughs> Let me, now we'll be a little bit bigger. Yeah, so um, in the chat, we would love to hear a little more from all of you. What is resonating? Uh, I asked uh, what, what, out of the four categories, what was motivating for people and the marketplace was coming up a lot. 
And um, John is just saying he hopes to review your presentation with our church members. That's great. And I'll put it on YouTube um, tonight uh, or tomorrow for, for you and send out the link as well. So you can, this is available for everyone. And yeah, just a lot of thank yous are coming in. Um, just one little nuts and bolts. Um, Valerie Cower was the yes. word's name. V-A-L-A-R-I-E. Yes. Last name K-A-U-R. Yes. Um, the chat could see that, but uh, people watching later might not be able right. to. And um, that we had a request. Could you repeat the Lund principle? Oh, the, so it's a, um, the Lund is a Lund, L-U-N-D, Lund principle. Um, Lund is a small, tiny town in Sweden, I believe, uh, right across from Stockholm. Uh, Copen, I mean, the, not a Stockholm, the Copenhagen, actually. Uh, so it's rather close to, uh, uh, the Copenhagen than Stockholm. But anyway, the Lund principle is the churches should act together, uh, except, uh, you know, except, uh, uh, except those, you know, the things that are, uh, let me just find the, the, uh, the words here. Um, oh, yeah, you can paraphrase, it's fine. The Lund principle is the church should act together in all matters, except those in which deep differences of conviction compelled, uh, compelled us to act separately. Great. Um, so, unfortunately, yes, uh, this is a very realistic statement, <laughs> realistic principle. Uh, but yeah, the uh, bottom line is that, uh, yes, we will work together. I like it. Great. And I put a Wikipedia link um, in the chat box just for people too, so they can they can research mm -hmm. that as well. Um, I'm not seeing a lot of other questions rolled in. I'm seeing a lot of enthusiasm, um, some some resonance with people. Um, so that's fantastic. And um, a little applause um, with asterisks are <laughs> are in the chat box. Um, thank you so much. Um, I think one question that that I have and uh, Paul may share is would you all like more about this? Like, would you like a little more concrete? Would you like the opportunity to have like a three or four or five day class, you know, like three or four or five hours, I guess, where we can dive into each one of these? Um, would that be of service to you, kind of more concrete tools to use with your churches to help? I, I think what was really helpful for me was it these topics go from being huge, broad, and very abstract to very concrete, like with the videos and with the, the envelope exercises. So if that would be of service to you, let us know in the chat box so we can keep that um, kind of in, in the hopper. And uh, we, uh, someone also wanted to know if you know the name of the video with the woman speaking about the Korean DMZ. Uh-huh. Uh, uh, her name is, uh, she said, she says so uh, at the very beginning of uh, the video, the. Liam Posek, right? Uh, mm -hmm. Something like um, so. She she is a documentary film director. Okay. And she created a um the documentary related to a Korean War. Um, but by her last name, I I don't think she's Korean, Korean American. If you get me the YouTube link, then I'll distribute it. Okay. For everyone, I'll, uh, I'll just do that by email, and we'll put it in the in the notes afterwards too. So I think that'll be great. And um, yeah, so I'm getting a lot of yeses that people would enjoy kind of having more uh, more learning about this, which I think would be really fa fabulous. People are always looking for tools, and yeah, I think like people are really wanting to know how can we begin, how can we get started, if, even in really small ways, to help keep us going. Okay, all oh, right, here it is, right here. <laughs> so this is a documentary. Uh, called the memory of forgotten war, uh, and her name is uh, Diane Borche Liam. So it's uh, hard to pronounce it. It's a uh, uh, last name is L I E M, and uh, if you just uh, Google her name L I E M with the uh, the words in a documentary film director, then you you can find her. And uh, the memory of forgotten war. This is a good actually good documentary that you can understand the context of a Korean War. Oh, that's fantastic. Thank you. Um, great. So we have that that resource available. Um, perfect. I don't think I have forgotten any questions or comments. If I have, please re retype them. They just got 
scroll scroll down too far. Um, but Paul, would it be okay with you if I tell a little people a little bit about DSF Discover oh, and then we'll any absolutely. questions? Okay, thanks. Okay. <laughs> All right, yeah, so I, I see some faithful people in here who have been with us since the very beginning. Um, DSF Discover started as an outgrowth of Disciple Seminary Foundation, a program of Disciple Seminary Foundation about a year and a half ago. And unfortunately, we've had to make the decision to close the program. It doesn't have anything to do with the content. Fabulous webinar presenters like uh, Reverend Paul here about the amazing classes that we've had. Uh, it's just it's really a decision about kind of streamlining budget other kind of things. So this is our final live webinar uh, in this form. So thank you, Paul, for being our <laughs> final presenter. <laughs> it's my honor. <laughs> oh, it's just such, it's so wonderful to end on the note of justice and peacemaking. Like I can't think of anything better. But what I want to let everyone know is that um, I've worked really strategically with DSF because I'll, I'll no longer be there um, as of tomorrow. Uh, tomorrow is my final day. But I've worked really strategically with DSF and they've been, everyone has been really supportive. We want this material to continue. The courses that we've had, we want them to remain available. They're really important. They've been impactful with people's lives. You can see how even just the hour that we've spent here today, a little bit less, can transform, you know, the way we think about this. And then, you know, the, the added uh, hours in a course give us even more opportunities. So I asked DSF and they were really enthused and uh, we all, we came to a great agreement. Could I continue to host some of the courses that we've had on my own, uh, and I have my own um, courses and spiritual development that I do out there on the side, and that we all—they said yes. So I'm going to give you the link. Oh, that is the wrong link. Give me one second. <laughs> Too many things going on at once. Here we go. So I'm going to give you the link. Just and this is just sign up, stay on the email list serve that is specifically for um, some of the courses that we've had, and you know we might be developing new ones like around just just peacekeeping. Um, so the link, I put it in the chat box. I'll give it to you one more way as well. Okay, so it should be a little broadcast to everyone as well. Um, and if you just click the, you know, keep me informed uh, little box that I have, uh, sign up here, then your email will be entered, you will be signed up, and I will send you information as it comes. The specific courses that I'll be um, transitioning to my site um, are inclusive community, um, True Inclusion with Brandon Robertson, uh, Transforming Your Communities with Chandra Dra, Social Media for Churches with me, uh, I taught that, and Unsilenced Domestic Violence with Courtney Armento. And so those are you know, four classes that'll be making the transition, new ones will be coming up. So uh, I wanted to give everyone that news and it's, it's, a, it's been a pleasure to serve. Uh, obviously I get to work with world-class instructors like Paul, Reverend Paul here, and uh, so it's been my delight, my joy to serve you. I see some of the, um, the thank yous coming in. You're welcome. Uh, it's been just a true joy. So that's that's the announcement. I think that's it for me. Mm -hmm. And we've got another question for you. Um, so this is from Devori, and she said uh, she mentioned that discernment as a practice is not very well known in the church. Um, and Devori is a spiritual director extraordinaire as well, I should say. Um, and uh, she thought the envelope idea was great for getting started. Do you have any other ideas or tips for helping people discern? Uh, so uh, yeah, I, uh, the reason why I'm hesitating to say anything is that, uh, um, yes, there is a, so it is not, yes, it is not easy to discern something as a, a collective body. And then, um, and then, oh, I, you know, this is not my expertise uh, per se. Um, I know that um, there are certain the, the practices that uh, you know the exercise that we can do together that can help us to uh, discern a little bit. Uh, so, but if you like to get uh, some practical ideas about the discerning process, um, the often I use the. The, co the process called uh, Church Unique. Uh, this is from more evangelical um, the, the world, but th the process itself is very helpful sometimes. So uh, if you are really uh, like to uh, just uh, um, understand how you can create a process to for, uh, for your church or your community to discern, I think that might be 
good resource. So you can buy the book, uh, Church Unique. Great. I like the name of it. And um, I would imagine that um, Quakers might have some really good practices for discernment as well. Mm. I can I can think of one or two, but they they do take some learning as well. Uh, mm -hmm. They're not they're not necessarily quick, but they're very effective. <laughs> yeah. yeah, great. But I don't see any other questions or comments coming in. I'm seeing a lot of affirmations. Thank you, Paul, so much. This has Thank been you. Really wonderful. Thank you. Yeah. So I think I'll go ahead and click the stop recording button, but we'll remain and we can chat uh, as we as everyone wraps up. So thank you, everyone. It's been so much fun to spend this hour with you. Thank you for taking the time.